Okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening to those here and to those watching this online and those who will be hearing it on Radio Maria. So this is the sixth of the seven talks, so <laughs> we're nearly there. Um, <clears throat> After Jesus had taken the bread and given thanks at the Last Supper, he broke it and gave it to his disciples to eat. Similarly, he gave them the cup, bidding them drink from it. So this is what we have got to now. After the preparation of the gifts, or offertory, and after the Eucharistic prayer, we come to the rite of communion. Just a little, tiny little footnote there. Uh, what is a rite? And if you look at many of the uh, liturgical books, they will say order of confirmation or order of matrimony or um, they will say in the future order of the Christian initiation of adults. The order of mass is the whole thing but within that you have bits and pieces and one of them is the rite of communion they are called rites smaller portions within the larger whole that's by the by but all this it, well now let me quote here uh, Tolkien Tolkien uh, as you know author of the Lord of the Rings, giving spiritual advice to his son. Tolkien went to Mass uh, every day. And this is him writing to his son. Out of the darkness of my life, so much frustrated, I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the blessed sacrament. There you will find romance, glory, honor, fidelity, and the true way of all your loves on earth. And more than that, wait for it, death. He means a death to self, which actually gives lasting life to all the things our hearts most desire. I put before you the one great thing to love on earth, the Blessed Sacrament. Now, we can say, talking of communion, we can say that the entire divine plan from creation to the kingdom of God at the end, the, divine, the whole divine plan has communion in the fullest sense of the word as its goal. For this, the Son of God was sent, lived, died, rose, and sent the Holy Spirit among us. In his human nature, he is the sign and instrument, the sacrament, of communion with God and unity among human beings. It was for this that he prayed in his great high priestly prayer that we find in John chapter 17, which was a Eucharistic prayer, really. Is, that they, his disciples, he was looking to the future, thinking of them in different times and places, may be one, even as we, himself and the Father, are one, I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one. And again, the very last verse of that prayer, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. That's the divine plan. And what is true of the whole divine economy or the divine strategy, if you like, in our regard, what is true of the whole course of Christ's life is also true of the Mass which is like a sacramental embodiment of this. The sacrifice made present 
during the Eucharistic prayer is not complete without the sacred meal. Okay, a sacrifice is completed by eating. The transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body of blood of Christ is geared to our transformation through Holy Communion. You, you remember the, the prayer we have called the Epiclesis, when we ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit upon the gifts, like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that prayer, we ask for the Holy Spirit before the consecration, but after the consecration, there is another epiclesis. Grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. That's Eucharistic prayer number three. It's clearer in number four. So the Holy Spirit is asked for to change the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And then after that, the Father is asked to send the Holy Spirit to transform us into the body of Christ. So the Eucharistic body is for the sake of the mystical body, as we call it, which is us as members of Christ. So everything, those are just different ways of, of saying this, everything is geared towards communion in, in the big sense of the word and in, in the mass, in the liturgy, in the sacramental sense. Okay. Um, well, now I'd like to look at that part of the mass, which we call the communion rite, which runs from... Uh, the Our Father, when we say, um, of course, my, my mind always goes blank when one needs to remember it, but uh, when we pray the Our Father, uh, right the way through to after communion, to the com uh, prayer after communion. And let's walk through it, because walk is perhaps the right word, because you remember we've been kneeling th throughout the Eucharistic prayer, and then we stand up, through him, with him, in him, uh, forever and ever, amen, kneeling. Then we stand up, and then taught by, divine, uh, the, by the divine precepts and so on, we say, we dare to say. And this is all going towards climax of the, the climax of the uh, rite of communion. Well, it's the reception of communion, obviously, but... In, in another sense, it's the procession. We don't think of it, but when we're coming to communion, it is a procession. That's the third great procession of the Mass. The first is the opening procession, when the ministers come in and the rest of us stand. The second great procession is at the offertory, when the gifts are brought up. And the third great procession is the procession towards Holy Communion when we come together. It's not, therefore, just a cue. It, it should be corporate. It should be orderly and reverent, a movement together towards the table of the Lord. You know, it, it always makes me think when, when you're, 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 you're celebrating well, it doesn't always, but sometimes, uh, of that moment in the Gospel of John at the feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus is on the hillside, and then he says, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat. Now, I think Jesus sees us, as it were, processing towards communion. He sees us as representative of all humanity, all of us sort of struggling 
uh, knowingly and unknowingly towards the generosity of God. Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Well, he bought the bread at the cost of his blood on the cross. That's where he bought the bread that we are able to eat. Now, the communion rite begins with people and priest, congregation and celebrant, daring to pray the Our Father. We dare to say. So, as Pope Gregory said, after the great prayer of sacrifice, the Eucharistic prayer, which, as I said, is a gift of the church, great gift of the church, we pray the prayer which is the gift of our Lord himself, the Our Father. We've just said through him, with him, in him, or to you, almighty Father, all glory and honor. And then let us dare to say, our Father, we stay in his presence. The bread that will be offered us is, in St. Thomas's phrase, the parnis filiorum, the bread of sons, the bread of the children, the bread that belongs to the children of God. Which one of you Jesus asked on the, in the Sermon on the Mount, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone. How much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? So at the heart of the Lord's Prayer comes the phrase, give us this day our daily bread. And that's obviously why we have this prayer here, because we're approaching uh, communion. And that, and that phrase can, you, 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 can never be understood simply of physical bread or even of all the good things that God gives us in this life to, to sustain us, precious and needful things as they are. But here above all, we are asking for the bread of heaven. We have said, our Father in heaven Give us our daily bread, earthly bread, but heavenly bread as well, the bread that comes down from heaven, the bread of life, the word of God accepted in faith, the body of Christ received in the Eucharist, says the Catechism. And when Jesus um, used this phrase, give us this day our, our daily bread, he is surely evoking the manna in the desert, which was given day by day, a portion each day, except a double portion on Friday, so they didn't have to work on the Sabbath to gather it. Give us this day our daily bread. And the Jews already believed that the manna was much more than was much more than this, or it pointed to something beyond itself. Uh, and they believed that when the Messiah came, he would give a new manner. He would give a new manner. So when Jesus is talking in the synagogue at Capernaum, he, he says that the manner, the bread that I will give, Moses gave you the manner, uh, and they all died. But my father is giving you the new bread. This is this bread which comes from above. The Eucharist is our daily bread, says St. Augustine. And the fathers of the church say this again and again, not to despise, you know, we, all, we know we all need the other bread as well. But this, um, uh, this is a bit of a digression, but not entirely, because we're very used to that formula, give us this day our daily bread. But the word that we translate daily is a word that first occurs in the New Testament, Greek word. It doesn't occur in any previous Greek literature or Greek writing that we know of. And we don't really know exactly what it means. Uh, and it, it's a uh, been translated daily, give us this day our daily bread. It's been translated like that. Um, but if you translated it or transliterated it almost literally, and St. Jerome did this, it would be super 
substantial. Super substantial bread. Give us this day our super substantial, super essential, hyper essential bread. Interesting. Interesting. So you get the Eucharistic resonance immediately. But okay, we pray, we're praying the Our Father, Our Father. Give us this day our daily bread. We are about to receive the bread of life in the Eucharist. And what's the next petition? Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who trespass against us. Well, we remember again what the Lord said in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. If you are offering your gift at the altar, he's talking about Jewish practice in, in the temple, not, uh, not about St. Peter's Basilica. If you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that you are your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Enmity and the Eucharist do not go together. Right. They just don't go together. Jesus says, sort it out first. Okay. So that's another reason in St. Augustine's mind, why we say this prayer, and because we want to come forgiving and forgiving to the Eucharist. When the Lord's Prayer is concluded, uh, you remember the celebrant develops the last petition, deliver us from evil into a prayer. We pray, deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress. So this is a prayer for freedom from the evil of sin and from all uh, distress. The Latin word is perturbatio, which means lots of things. Trouble, disorder, inner and outer upset. So that the leaven of sin and the level of sort of restlessness and unhappiness is not eating away at us. And this prayer, this prayer that we say immediately after the Lord's Prayer, is called the embolism. There are a lot of these nice sort of unusual words that you can drop into conversation uh, uh, but in, in, that come in the liturgy, embolism. But um, it just actually means an insertion. It's, it's something that's put between two other things. And it ends... You remember, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now, that's an addition. That's, uh, that wasn't in the old Mass. And it's taken from St. Paul's letter to Titus. And it's to orientate us towards the coming, towards the parousia, towards the second coming of Christ. Look, and this is a very important point because there's been a lot of uh, interest, uh, attention given to the Eucharist, the celebration of the Eucharist as something that brings what is past, namely the Last Supper and uh, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross into the present. Okay? That's, that's in many ways how we understand the Mass. But the Mass also brings the future into the present. It is already uh, a trailer, a prelude, a foreshadowing of the second coming. Christ comes to us at Mass as he will come in glory at the end of time. And then the embolism is rounded off when we all say, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. That's a very, very, very ancient prayer. Um, could well go back to the first century. It's not actually. It's in some manuscripts of the New Testament uh, at the end of the Lord's Prayer. As you know, Anglicans and, and Church of Scotland people often say that when you go to these things. They, they say that. And it's been there for, you know, getting on 2,000 years. Now, okay, so that's the first thing, this, this, um, th 
this, the Our Father, and the, the prayer for the bread, the prayer for forgiveness. And then we come, the next step, as we're moving towards Holy Communion, is the prayer for peace. Remember Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. And it's a very, it's a touching prayer, isn't it? When we say, you know, do not, do not look at our sins, but on the faith of your church. Please, as it were, do, a, do what Admiral Nelson did, you know? Looked through, he only had one eye, and when he didn't want to read the signal from the Admiral, he put the telescope to his blind eye. So I don't see any signal from the Admiral. And he did what he wanted and won the battle. Uh, well, we're asking the Lord to put his telescope to his blind eye as regards our sins, but to see our faith as we approach him. Now, the sign of peace flows on naturally. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. We have just heard, we have, uh, that comes from the Last Supper, of course, from Jesus' last discourse. And then um, the, the priest says, peace be with you, and uh, uh, offer each other the sign of peace. Now, <laughs> uh, this, this, there, there are several things to say about this. Of course, COVID has come into it. Uh, and so we've been a bit more restrained since COVID, or not, either not done it at all or been more restrained. And personally, I think that's lovely. Uh, and that um, I think it, it really is enough to turn to the person beside you. You don't have to go charging around and scrum, throw yourself upon people and kiss them on the lips and, and all of that just to show how loving you are. Uh, it's, that's not the point. That's not what it's about. It's not how wonderfully chummy I am. This is the peace of the Lord be with you. The peace of Christ. I give not as the world gives, not just as your chums give. This, and this peace comes from the altar it's very important. It, come, it is the priest who says, peace be with you. And then he gives it to the people near him. And then, and, and then the people give it to each other. It is the peace of the Lord we're offering to each other. It's not meant to be a rugby scrum or a demonstration of personal friendliness. It, it's a, a reverent entering into that peace which passes all understanding as... St. Paul says, or that unity of spirit in the bond of peace. You probably think I'm being a terrible spoil sport, but you don't want a great schmozzle at this moment when we're approaching, we're approaching Holy Communion. Uh, the Roman liturgy has always had it at this point in the, some of the Eastern liturgies, in the Byzantine liturgy, for example, it takes, it's done after the creed earlier on in the Mass. And when a few years ago there was a synod on the Eucharist in Rome, uh, the, there was a great discussion about this because some of the bishops were unhappy about this, as I say, the rugby scrum aspect of it. And uh, should we do what the Easterners do and put it, and put it earlier in the Mass after the creed? Um, before we go to the altar, as it were. That was the thinking there. Anyway, the decision was, no, we, we keep it where it is. This is what the Roman liturgy has always done for, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. So let's leave it, let's leave it where it is, but do it in a dignified word, way. So what are we praying for? You know, the daily bread, nourishment. We're praying for forgiveness. We're praying for freedom from sin and disturbance. We're praying for peace. We're praying for the unity of the church. And these are all, th that's what the Eucharist is about. You know, we're, we're, we are being in the best sense of the word psyched up to receive communion, right? And now the focus becomes ever more Jesus himself. We come to the gesture of the breaking of the bread. Well, I, I always remember on a Sunday, uh, it was a great, 
thing um, that, you know, we'd have the roast joint of meat and uh, my father would carve it. This was a quasi-sacramental moment on a, you know, uh, on Sunday. He, he would carve it and put it on the place and it would go around and would go around the family. Well, originally, the breaking of the bread is the same thing. That is what a father, a Jewish father, but I'm sure, you know, done not just among the Jews, but uh, the, the Jewish father of the family would do at a meal, and especially at Passover and the big the holy meals, as it were. Uh, he, he would take the bread and break it and then give it to the children. And as we know, in the early church, this gesture gave its name to the celebration of the bread. That was what the Eucharist was called. What we call the Mass was called the breaking of bread. And I think, you know, it was, uh, it was one of Jesus' signature gestures. You know, everybody has their own gestures or little characteristics, little ways of doing things. You know, whether it's pouring the tea or slamming the door or whatever it may be. And Jesus, Jesus liked to, to do this. He liked being at table with people and he liked, therefore, taking the bread and breaking it. It, 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 it summed up himself in many ways. You remember in, in the Gospel of um, Matthew, he feeds, first of all, the 5,000, and then he feeds the 4,000. And in both cases, he takes the bread and breaks it. And then he gives it, interestingly, to his disciples to give on to the people. It's all very like the Mass. And then at the Last Supper, he broke the bread. And then in the famous story, the walk to Emmaus, when did the two disciples realize who their companion was? They recognized him at the breaking of the bread. That was it. It was classic Jesus. They suddenly, oh gosh, it's him. You know, that's it. But because, as I say, the whole of him is in that gesture because, you know, he, he at the cost of himself, he was broken on the cross, we might say. He gives himself to us. It, it's, it's this, he is the bread, and he is broken to nourish us. And yet, though broken, he is not divided. Each child round the table receives the same bread. And we say, don't we, in connection directly with the Eucharist, that Christ is present whole and entire in each particle of the host. The bread that we break, said St. Paul, is it not a communion in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Now, we're used nowadays to small hosts, many small hosts as a larger host uh, and, and for the, the celebrant and <clears throat> other celebrants perhaps and then many small hosts. But for the first thousand, thousand years or so, uh, it wasn't like that. There would, there would just be one bread for everyone. So it would have been, been quite a gesture. It would have taken quite a time. And there was even another rite was that if the Pope was celebrating in a church in Rome, uh, he would break the bread and then put aside and go into little white bags, uh, two or three um, fragments of the, of the consecrated bread, and they would be carried to neighboring churches. And then when we get to the point where the priest drops a bit of the host into the chalice, they would use what had come from the Pope. So that they were celebrating, as it were, Mass with the Pope. It was a very nice way of expressing 
the unity of the church. So, there it is. Yes, and that's this other element that comes in here, that, that when, the, when the priest breaks the larger hoof, he puts a fragment into the chalice, and he, he, he's praying then for a, a fruitful communion. And this is sometimes called the mingling. And people love to reflect on possible deeper meanings of this. Why is this little piece of the host put in? Well, at uh, the consecration, the bread and wine are consecrated separately. It's interesting. They don't say this, uh, uh, as it were, the priest doesn't take the bread in one hand and the chalice in another and say, uh, this is my body, this is the chalice of my blood. They're done separately because this represents the, the separation of Jesus' own body and blood at the time of the crucifixion. And uh, in a sense, therefore, when the, a portion of the host is put into the chalice, the bread and the wine, the body and the blood, are brought together again. And that is a sign, it is said sometimes, of the resurrection. Because that's what happened at the resurrection. Jesus was, as it were, broken on the cross. His body and his blood were separated. The blood poured out of his side. In the resurrection, everything is brought together again. So communion is the the breakthrough of the risen Christ into our lives. Now, it's all very, uh, I mean, it, 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 it's all very moving, isn't it, this? I mean, I'm sure you, you I, I don't mean what I'm saying, but <laughs> what is happening uh, at the Mass. There's a transparency about it. If, if, you, if you go to the Holy Land, I, I've only done it once, but I found you go to some places and... Uh, Christ seems a lot closer in them than in others. Right. There's, just, there's less clutter in the way, and, and he, sh he shines through. You, you can contact the Gospels, as it were, immediately. And at this point in the Mass, the closeness of Christ, I think, is, is to the fore. He is very transparent. And suddenly... We, we start hearing of the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God. He has been mentioned in the Gloria, but then again, Lamb of God, Agnus Dei, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's appealed to as the bread is broken. St. Thomas says that the Paschal Lamb, the Lamb of the Passover, is the biblical figure, the Old Testament, as it were, sign of what the Eucharist is about. It's, it's all there. And the, uh, the triple Lamb of God that we say, or hopefully sing, this goes back to the seventh century and to a pope who was uh, an Eastern, an Eastern, a pope from Syria, actually, who, and he added this to the Mass. And the Lamb is asked, uh, the Lamb of God, Christ, is asked for mercy, miserere nobis, have mercy on us, and then grant us peace. We all know there are very beautiful settings of that in the musical tradition of Western culture right up to today. Many beautiful settings. And uh, in his, um, uh, Beethoven wrote two masses, set two masses to music, and in the, his great one, the big one, the, the Missa Solemnis, um, which he wrote towards the end of his life at the same time as the Ninth Symphony, and he took a long time over it. It was a friend of his had become, had been made an archbishop, and uh, the friend asked him to compose a mass for his uh, ordination as a bishop. Well, Beethoven being Beethoven, it was late, it was late, it wasn't, it, 
We didn't finish it till about two years <laughs> afterwards. But uh, it's a wonderful piece of music. But when he writes, when he comes to set Anya's Day, uh, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, Dona Nobis Parchem, he, he wrote, because he was living during, uh, lived through the Napoleonic Wars, he wrote uh, above it a prayer for inner and outer peace. And there are, there is the roll of drums that, that you can hear where there's, there's this, the sounds of war are brought in. And then there's this great prayer and the sound of war dies away. Well, we need that, don't we? Now, the theme of the Lamb runs through the whole Bible, literally, from the first book to the last. The first act of human worship we find in the Bible is the offering of Abel, son of Adam and Eve. And it's, what does he offer? From his flock, the firstlings of his flock. And then, hop, skip, and a jump to the last book, to Revelation, the Apocalypse. We're given visions of the heavenly liturgy, and at the center of the heavenly liturgy, there is the Lamb. The Lamb in the midst of the throne. The throne is God the Father. The Lamb is the Son. And the Lamb is slain, but standing. In other words, crucified, but risen. And he is the center of the heavenly liturgy. And the whole of creation um, worships him. In, in the image of a lamb, there's the whole mix of suffering and triumph, of innocent victimhood and divine vindication. Christ is the paschal lamb par excellence. So this very much comes to the fore. It is the lamb. This is our Passover. This is our Passover. Right. The priest then genuflects in adoration. The divine lamb is sacramentally present. And then he holds up the consecrated host. Uh, and he can also, the, the last edition of the Missal, he can also uh, hold up the chalice beneath it. So he shows the people both the body and the blood of the Lord. It's optional. But that's, I find it very powerful, that. Because here's the Lamb of God whose blood has been shed. And again, they're, they're brought together. So this... St. Thomas Aquinas says, I mean, as well as you don't need St. Thomas Aquinas to say it, but if you're going to have a proper meal, you've got to eat and drink. You know, if you just have a drink, that's not a meal. And if you just have a piece of bread, that's not a meal. A meal, you have to eat and drink. And so, in the Paschal meal also. There follows the invitation to communion. This is always a moment, isn't it? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Twice then we are invited to behold, to behold. The, the previous translation said, this is the Lamb of God. No, no, no. It's much better. Behold the Lamb of God. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Uh, with the eye of faith. And those, that word, behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, as we know, those are the words of John the Baptist at the very beginning of the Gospel of John. Uh, it's an interesting thing one commentator pointed out. Uh, if, if that was by the Jordan, and the number of lambs slaughtered in the temple, killed even on a daily basis in the temple, was considerable. And at Passover, massive. Every family brought along a lamb to be slain. Imagine how many lambs that was. And uh, the, there's this rather nice... <laughs> John the Baptist is standing by the River Jordan, and all these lambs, it's on the road going up to Jerusalem, and all these lambs, there are thousands of lambs around, or being sent up to the market for the Passover. So the plate, ba 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 everywhere. And then, and John says, 
behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. These were little pastoral lambs. They didn't know it, poor things. Okay, going up to be slaughtered. And he points out, behold, the Lamb of God. And John called himself a voice. John had his head chopped off because Herod and Herod's wife didn't like what came out out of his mouth. They tried to silence him. And just think that his words are heard now every time the Mass is celebrated in the Roman Rite throughout the world. How many times each day? So you can't silence the truth. Behold the Lamb of God. It's and then the next line, this is new, is taken from the Apocalypse. And it's the saying of an angel, blessed, um, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Now that comes from, as I say, the book of Revelation, where the Lamb of God, the Lamb is mentioned 28 times. The Lamb is the center of the last book of the Bible. And actually the full version of what the angel says is blessed are those invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. We, we just have blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. But this is, uh, it, the, the Bible actually says the marriage supper of the Lamb. And that's true. The, you can use, you, obviously you've got to be a bit careful and restrained about it, but you can use marital imagery for what happens at communion. Obviously you can. And uh, the, the, the bride is joined to the bridegroom, united in body and spirit. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Well, we've heard the words of a prophet and, and we've heard the words of an angel. And now we come down with a bang to a Roman army officer, poor fellow, very distressed about the state of his servant, who is suffering terribly, he says, and he goes to Jesus. He's not a Jew, but he recognizes something in Jesus, and he makes this wonderful act of faith. He said, look, I know you don't even have to come to my house. Because you're a Jew and you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to go into the house of a Gentile anyway. You wouldn't do that. So he's being very polite. And, and I know you have the power to do it. And Jesus is actually, to put it into modern English, Jesus is wowed by that. He says, I've never met faith like this in Israel. So it's, uh, this, is, this is amazing. This is amazing, this man. So it's a beautiful act of faith and humility. And as we know, uh, the, the servant was cured. So when we say it, we change servant, that the man says, the, 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 the soldier says, um, my servant will be healed. Just say the word and my servant will be healed. We say, my soul will be healed for obvious reasons. Uh, now, we, we've, since the new translation came in in 2011, uh, in, in the English version, roof has come back. Ru, ru, roof was always there in the Latin, but it just said, I'm not worthy to receive you, I think, was the old form. Not worthy. And then roof came back. And I remember some people said, oh, what's this roof doing there? What, what, uh, I, don't, I, I haven't got a roof. What does it mean? And I thought, well... Use your imagination, for goodness sake. You know, I mean, <laughs> can't we speak of ourselves as a house? <laughs> uh, and St. Teresa of Avila talks of the interior mansions, so I think it's rather inspiring to think of, of uh, Christ, Jesus visiting us in this sacrament as he visited the houses of people during his life. He didn't go to the house of the centurion, because he did heal him by a word. He did what the centurion asked. But he does come to us. 
The communion procession follows. As I say, uh, we go forward, we go forward. And uh, it's not just a me thing, an individual thing. Um, this procession is us, it's we, it's the worshiping assembly once again, the church gathered in this place, going forward as one to receive its Lord. And the sacrament under one or two kinds is brought by the celebrant to the people. Uh, and th that is very important. It, it's not, I mean, this has happened sometimes and it is an abuse. I don't mean it's happened here. Uh, that um, it, the Eucharist is not self-service. It's not a buffet. It's not a buffet. You don't just, can't, we don't just leave all the hosts and... And, and the chalice on the altar and say, well, come up, chaps and guys, and help yourselves. No, it, it is given. It's a gift from the Lord. It comes from the altar again, which is the symbol of Christ, and it comes through the appointed ministers. Just as Jesus gave the bread that he multiplied to the 5,000 and 4,000 to the people through his disciples and uh, the ordinary minister to use canonical language the ordinary minister of holy communion are a bishop a priest or a deacon and it's their privilege and their right and duty now we're blessed to have people who help us um, because of numbers and so on but uh, I, I find it a very very moving moment in the mass when you are giving holy communion and 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 you've got all these different people some more focused than others one must say uh, but you've got all these faces that come to you one by one and there's so much written on faces you know everybody's got their story everybody's got their suffering and their joy and you know uh, everything that's wonderful and everything that's a bit weird and so on it's all there and they and they come up it's a very it's a very uh, I find a very moving moment but uh, the Eucharist is a gift that is from outside us and from above us and it's mediated to us it is my father said Jesus who gives you the true bread from heaven we have this phrase don't we in common English nowadays with fast food I uh, let's grab something to eat I'm going to grab something to eat it's dreadful I mean I use it myself it's a dreadful thing to say. You know, grab something. You don't grab it. You know, even ordinary food, you don't grab it. You might if you're desperately hungry, of course. <laughs> but there we are. Now, okay, hop, skip, and a jump. There's so much. It's, it's the messiest part of the Mass, isn't it? The giving of Holy Communion. It's the most, it's, it, and it can be a bit fraught if, uh, for, for, for if you're giving Holy Communion or you're one of the extraordinary ministers and, and so on. And it can be fraught for people receiving Holy Communion as well, and it's all a bit of a mess and it needs organizing and it never quite works properly and all of that. But uh, before giving Holy Communion to the communicant, the minister, shows him or her the consecrated host and says, the body of Christ. And we all know the answer. Amen here means, yes, indeed, so it is. But interestingly, that mass, that amen, was not in the old mass. The recipient said nothing. So it was, may the body of Christ keep you to everlasting life and nothing was said I think it's very salutary that amen is said now it gives the person an opportunity to profess their faith in what is being given them you remember how at the end of the Eucharistic prayer does the great doxology through him, with him, in him, concluded by the great Amen, which is often sung. Amen. That's the great Amen. 
This is a small amen. This is a personal amen. The body of Christ, amen. It, it shouldn't be omitted. It shouldn't be mumbled. Uh, I, I get, if, if someone doesn't say it, I hesitate. Because I want to hear them say, amen. Yeah, I believe, yes. So be it. So it is. Okay. Right. We're getting there. We're getting there. So there's that great amen, and there's that small amen, and they're both key. A corporate amen and a personal amen. Now, okay, we're, we're talking here about receiving Holy Communion. This is holy ground, of course, and at the same time, as we know, it's a minefield. Uh, in every way. If it's the burning bush, well, the burning bush is a thorn bush. Uh, and there are many um, practical and theological questions that come here, some less fraught, some very fraught, some highly controversial, some that cause great anger and angst and heart searching. You know the kind of thing I'm talking about. They may be the manner of receiving the, of the Eucharist. Do I receive on the hand? Do I receive uh, on the tongue? But there may be much bigger issues uh, if I am divorced and remarried. Why can I not receive? If I am an Anglican married to a Catholic, why can't we come to Mass together and I receive at the same time? And so on. And there are books and books and more than books about all these things, there's in the blogs and everywhere. Now, I can't obviously uh, go into all these things, or even really any of them in particular. One would need all day. But it, it's interesting. I just want to, uh, I hope this helps much to say. There's that great Scottish phrase, it's I been. It's always been like this, and it has. It, the, the paradox is that the Eucharist, which is the sacrament of unity, is often the place where there is an awful lot of disunity. There's an awful lot of squabbling and quarreling and fighting goes on. It's a mystery, that. It's a mystery. But it seems to be part of the package. If you just go back to the Bible, in John chapter 6 is the first explicit mention of the Eucharist. When Jesus ends that great discourse by saying that we must eat his flesh and drink his blood. What happens? There's a schism. There's a walkout of the disciples. Many of them no longer went with him. This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? It was, a, it was a moment of division. Think of the Last Supper. What's going on? Apart from the passion looming, there's Judas. One of you will betray me. It's the one who will take the bread that I will dip in the wine. It's an anti-communion that Judas has. And... He goes out, and as John says, it was night. The Eucharist is celebrated under storm clouds. Why do we have, in the first letter to the Corinthians, the earliest description of how the first Christians celebrated the Eucharist? Because things were going horribly wrong. That's the only reason why Paul mentions it. Because people were getting drunk, uh, because there was a meal beforehand. People were being horrible to each other. Uh, he was saying people are, in our language, receiving the sacrament unworthily. That's why, that's why we've got that. We wouldn't, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't have anything. For, he would never have mentioned it if it was all hunky-dory. We only have it. And so the Eucharist is where the battle rages, perhaps. 
And perhaps this is a reminder that we are only, still only on the way. You know, <laughs> blessed are those called to the supper, the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is set at the end of time and set beyond all conflict, which is set in heaven. There the Eucharist will be fully realized. Here and now, we are still living in the midst of imperfection. Sorry. Okay, I'm nearly there. That's all I really want to say on that. Just to, to say that, well, the church has to navigate herself, her way through these things throughout history. Some of the biggest theological arguments have been around the real present, as we know. Some of the big moral questions are around who can receive communion. Some of the great ecumenical questions are all around this, and so on. Uh, and the church has to navigate, and we always do well to follow the teaching of the church and the discipline of the church. I'll leave it there. But, as it were, when, when it said, blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb, that is, the marriage feast of the Lamb, which will be celebrated the other side of all tears. That's really it. In our Eucharist, there will still be tears. So we're still on the way. Now the communion rite ends uh, with a prayer proclaimed by the celebrant, the post-communion prayer. This is a pattern we've seen before, how you've got a, a bit, a bit of the mass, and it ends with a prayer recited by the, the, the president, uh, uh, the celebrant. And this is the last question to address tonight. I should have <laughs> really begun with it. But what does Holy Communion bring us? Because the actual reception may be in very distracting circumstances. As we know, we can be horribly distracted. I mean, we might have a toothache. We might be next to someone with a bawling child, uh, and so on. It's not. Um, the, uh, and it's all a bit, it can be almost, again, physically, emotionally, something of an anticlimax tiny little bit of something. It's almost an act of faith to believe it's bread, let alone the body of Christ. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we don't ex expect necessarily a great emotional or psychological experience. So we're called to faith. My flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. What are the fruits of Holy Communion? Well, there is just such a wealth of doctrine and devotion here, rooted in Scripture, so much rich teaching, so many beautiful prayers and hymns that we know, Soul of Christ and so on, and the hymns of St. Thomas Aquinas and others, new and old, so much poetry, there are wonderful stories of the transfiguring effects of Holy Communion in the lives of people. There are, there are moving tales from people who've been in prison on the gulags and the concentration camps and priests who manage somehow to celebrate the Eucharist. One Vietnamese archbishop, he just had a tiny bit of bread and just a little drop of wine he managed to get in, on, on his palm. He just got a little bit of wine on his palm and he was able, against all the rules, to celebrate the Mass every day. And he says that's what sustained him. It would be an interesting exercise to go through the post-communion prayers. So, just very briefly, very briefly, because 
it's, it's a huge subject. But according to St. John's Gospel, eating the flesh and drinking the blood of Christ means having eternal life and future resurrection. It's John chapter 6. It means abiding in Christ, remain in me and he will remain in us, Christ us. It means living because of Christ, as I live from the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. That means from me and for me. According to St. Paul, we who are many are one body. We all partake of the one bread. So through Holy Communion, we are united with Christ, and through Christ, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, and at the same time, we are united with each other. As the fathers love to say, fathers of the church, we become what we receive. We receive the body of Christ, and we become the body of Christ. That's the miracle. And it's not so much we who receive Christ as Christ who receives us. We are assimilated to him and he fulfills himself in us. You could, it, it, it's good to see it that way. It's not me receiving Christ, it's Christ receiving me, actually. When we eat food, that food becomes part of us. When we eat Christ, we become part of Christ. It's a wonderful thing. And here's another thought, I have to say it's not original, but it struck me, uh, that Jesus is, as it were, uh, fulfilling himself, growing himself, growing his body in the moment of communion. Jesus was a first century man. He was a Jew. He wasn't a woman. Uh, he wasn't a Gentile. He was celibate. Uh, he never had a family. He wasn't African, he wasn't American, he wasn't European, he wasn't Chinese, he didn't experience old age, um, other things he didn't experience. But in us, through Holy Communion, he does. He enters our old age, if, if you know, we are old, not you. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, so, uh, if, if he enters Chinese people who receive him, it's that intimate. It's an interesting thought, that. Now, I began with Tolkien calling the Blessed Sacrament the one great thing to love on earth. Now, here are some lines, most original, I think from a woman poet whose life partly overlapped with his. She was a Catholic like him, Alice Menor. And she always, like Tolkien, she's got a sort of the lay, the lay take on things, which is often a bit fresher than the clerical take, and quite, quite uh, original. And it's, it's a poem about an experience that she had. Uh, she was at Mass. This might help people who are, are, when they're in positions when they cannot receive Holy Communion themselves. She was at Mass, and next to her was someone she didn't know, a man she didn't know. And he goes up to Communion and comes back to his seat, and she doesn't go to Communion. Instead, have you ever thought of this? Instead, she prays to Christ present in the unknown man beside her. Right. The poem is called The Unknown God, and these are just a few lines. O Christ, in this man's life, this stranger who is thine, in all his strife, all his felicity, his good and ill, in the assaulted stronghold of his will, I do confess thee here, alive within this life. Christ, in his 
unknown heart, his intellect unknown. This battle and this peace, this destiny that I shall never know, Christ, look on me. Christ in his numbered breath, Christ in his beating heart and in his death, Christ in his mystery, from that secret place and from that separate dwelling, give me grace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I, I meant it to be shorter, and it was longer. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> thank you. Okay. We're, we're going to have uh, questions and answers, but we're going to use the microphones because uh, people at the back can't hear the people at the front, and you're struggling to hear me at the moment, and it's always good to hear the questions. The microphone's going to come on. One, two. Okay, wonderful. So we're going to have questions and answers. And it, it would be good if when you ask the question that you ask it through the microphone so we can all hear it. Because I've, I've certainly been just at the side and not being able to hear somebody asking the questions. Uh, w there are also people, a few people on, on watching on YouTube. And if you have a question you'd like to ask from there, just put it in the chat, and then uh, that question, uh, we'll, we'll ask that question to Bishop Hugh after. So that enables everyone to, to join in with the conversation, join in with this, this uh, talk. So any, any questions? Um, it struck me when you talk about peace, because you've been talking about transformation during the whole talks, but rather today, the gift of peace and as a gift from God, but uh, humanity hasn't assimilated. So I was struck by that. I'm wondering, you know, spiritually, why is that? Is it so complicated to have it? Yeah. Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> It does appear to be very complicated, <laughs> doesn't it? Yes. Uh, and, you know, Jesus does say, uh, you know, it's my peace I give you, not as the world gives. And uh, world peace, as we know, especially at the moment, is always very fragile. And our own uh, so mental, psychological, emotional peace is very fragile. It just needs somebody to say something to us, and off we go, and we're, we're upset. Uh, so there must be a distinction somewhere that uh, there, there is this peace that comes that is, that is ultimately the peace of the, the union of the Father and the Son, and that is what we are introduced into through the Eucharist, I think. And that peace, and that peace can uh, subsist, can, can, can be in us, or be in a family, or be in a parish, even though, uh, as Pope Francis would say, the plates are flying, you know. There are arguments going on, and there's trouble going on, and yet, if we are, uh, if if we are held together by Christ, we can, we can still experience His peace. So we we do do all we can to create peace in every sense, but we will never totally succeed. But this, the peace of Christ is always available. And we just hope that, as it were, drips through. That's the best I can do. I mean, it's a huge question. Yeah. Thanks. <clears throat> um, 
more of a comment on the question, but yes. you were talking about uh, the imagery and reality of the sacrificial lamb. And it, it was occurring, I suppose it's stating the obvious, but the Last Supper, we take away from that the institution of the Eucharist. But in addition, it was a meal of a sacrificial lamb. So yes. it, it's kind of nested yeah. yet again, yeah. one, one yeah. aside the other. Yes. Um, th that, uh, uh, th that is a great discussion uh, because um, there is there is a great discussion among the scholars because there is the chronology of the Gospel of John. You probably, uh, forgive me, Kevin, you probably know this, but there's a chronology of the Gospel of John and there's a chronology of uh, the other Gospels, the Synoptics. And in the Synoptics, it's clear that the Last Supper coincides with the Passover Supper. But on John's St. John's chronology, it doesn't. It coincides with Christ's crucifixion. And that's why they will look on the one whom they have pierced, and none of his bones shall be broken. That was the very moment when the lambs were being sacrificed in the temple. Jesus dies at that very moment in the Gospel of John. So the supper might not have been a Passover supper. But certainly the context is the Passover. What, is, what strikes me is the lamb is never mentioned. It doesn't say after they had eaten the Passover lamb. And that's, it's as if, as it were, the lamb has disappeared into Jesus, as it were. He's taken over the lamb. He is the lamb. And of course, it's a very moving thing that in the, the Jewish Passover, since the destruction of the temple and the end of the sacrifices, there is no lamb. There is just a bone. One bone on the, on the table, a lamb bone on the table, but no lamb. But yeah, it's fascinating stuff, really. Sounds like there's a question from chat. Yes, we do have one question from Joseph. The question is, do you see the church having more Eucharistic prayers in the future? New compositions, thank you. I'm not a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, the, the, um, it, yeah, I really don't know. What an interesting question. I wouldn't like to say uh, that there is a sense, perhaps, among, <laughs> among bishops and so on, and not only bishops, that there has been much change in the Mass and that to have some stability uh, would be good for us all, to have a, a, a time without too many changes. And in order to uh, go more into what we already have, I mean, that's what I'm just trying to do. You know, we have the Mass, we have this Mass, and there's so much in it. And I, I don't mean when we're going through Mass, we think of all these things I mentioned. Obviously, we don't. We're on automatic, really, uh, which is fine. But uh, the, there's so much there that I think this is the time you know, to let, to let the dust settle, rather, or to let us appreciate and reflect on and get to know better and better what we already have so that it come, comes into us. But, uh, you know, it's the Roman liturgy and the Pope is the Bishop of Rome and <laughs> it's his decision. <laughs> there is that too. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yes. 